Okay, I think we are live on the air, as it were, uh, if it means on the air to be going through a bunch of tubes to YouTube. Uh, and it's uh, a delight to be with uh, Howard Rheingold, who uh, our media lit uh, online course folks have heard from this week, and uh, with Christy Roschke, who has uh, been uh, incredibly great uh, uh, co-instructor on this course, uh, the lead teaching assistant, and uh, a real expert in media literacy. So thank you both. And uh, I'm going to just jump in with a question for Howard, and that is, uh, for a long time, you've been collecting resources uh, for what you so memorably call crap detection. Uh, the, the list seems to keep growing. Uh, do you think it's ever going to stop growing? Uh, the sophistication of the crap is continuing to evolve, so it's kind of like it's, it's an, an arms race, you know, just like a human arms race or a biological arms race. You know, the, uh, the deer got, the, both the deer and the, and the lions got faster over time. Um, and I think the, the big issue is whether the, the, the larger percentage of people who have access to online information will also have at least access to some education about telling the good stuff from the bad stuff. But for those who do know, and particularly for journalists and, and educators, um, doctors and patients, people um, who have a real stake in, in knowing uh, how to determine good information from bad information, I think having a, a, a good uh, toolbox is, is always going to be important. The, the ability to tell whether a, a, a photograph is, is faked. Um, you know, tools for determining whether a medication is, has actually been tested or not. I think those, those things are going to continue to be important. I would love to see some evolution into the web browser. Um, I know there was an attempt some years ago that, that may still be continuing, I haven't checked it, from the uh, National Institute of Health to ha have a, um, an add-on to your browser so that if you're looking at a medical site you can tell whether it has been approved or not. Because as I said at the beginning, there are sites that look so good that are totally bogus. You know, there's the, the one that claims to have, uh, have uh, genetically modified a chimpanzee to communicate with you, and there's a, a, an ad for a medication called Hetracil that will turn people into heterosexuals, and uh, you know, all, all kinds of things that look, people have done a very good job of faking. And then there's the greenwashing of the, the chemical industry um, creating a site about how some chemicals aren't so bad and not saying that they're the chemical industry. Um, there was the uh, New York measure to try to tax sugary beverages. There was the New Yorkers Against Excessive Taxation who had a, a website that, that furnished arguments against this taxation and it didn't um, disclose that it was sponsored by by the people who sold sugary beverages. So I, I the, the need isn't going to go away. Ethan Zuckerman, uh, our mutual friend and uh, someone we're talking with in this course, posted uh, a quite alarming actually piece uh, the other day in his blog about the uh, increasing sophistication of. Uh, governments and uh, industries uh, in an effort to basically create doubt uh, as opposed to uh, spread things that are uh, obviously false once you look at them and uh, pointing to Russia in its uh, handling of uh, Ukraine and, and the uh, uh, 
industry, the energy industry in particular when it comes to global warming and climate change. Uh, that it strikes me as a really kind of scary thing, the idea that we're uh, to sort of poison the well for everybody so that nobody believes anything that they see. Uh, how are we going to deal with that? Well, you know, that, that particular uh, toolbox of sophisticated tactics comes straight out of the tobacco industry playbook. Back when the scientific evidence that tobacco causes cancer began to, to spread, um, they developed a strategy which has been adopted by governments, <clears throat> it's been, a, <clears throat> excuse me, adopted by climate change deniers and others. So, you know, um, when I was teaching uh, journalism students, I introduced them to this notion of the public sphere that only people who take political science courses, for the most part, hear about. It's this idea that democracy is not just about voting for your leaders, it's about having a population that's able to govern itself because it's not only free to speak, but it's educated uh, enough and has an, uh, enough access to good information to discuss issues and form public opinion and, and influence policy. But the fear of uh, Habermas, the, the guy who came up with this theory, was that the sophistication of the public relations industry would poison the well exactly as, as you said and I think that his, his fears, uh, uh, I asked him about it when he was at Stanford and he doesn't know anything about the internet so but it's, it's pretty clear that um, his, his fears have been multiplied the way so many other things have been multiplied by the, the, the power of the internet you know if only George Orwell and Aldous Huxley could, could live to see how both of their fears have been uh, turned into 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 weapons for the unscrupulous. Um, that would be very interesting and sad. Christy, uh, you have been monitoring our uh, course forums and the social media sites. Uh, uh, two things: Do you are there some questions for Howard that you found? And secondly, uh, what do you have to ask Howard? I do have a couple questions from our discussion board here in the course. Some interesting questions here. This one about war reporting it says, when a war is fought using weapons with technology like in automobiles, where the machines adjust to situations overriding human control, what do you suppose will become of reporting from the front lines? How could you source the reliability of the reporting? It's a really good question. You know, that's, uh, I think the the US military learned from Vietnam that they need to kind of control uh, journalists in war zones. It used to be um, all kinds of uh, crazy adventurous uh, reporters uh, ran off to Vietnam and, and hitched rides on jeeps and part of the, the change in public opinion about the war in Vietnam came from the reporting that wasn't controlled and of course in Operation Desert Storm entering a terror it wasn't so easy to hitch a ride to Iraq and, and get in so the idea of embedded reporters uh, embedded journalists really became widespread and but I think you, you you've got to have humans in inside there talking to, to people doing what journalists do I think this speaks to the wider question of now that that we've got a couple of billion people with s smartphones with video um, what's the role of the journalists well we've got many 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 more reporters uh, but people who are accustomed to and trained in um, getting out there and talking to people and digging up the story and trying to compare the different stories and figure out what is more likely to be true that's that's more important than ever and I think uh, with with all of the, uh, the the idea of automating warfare is kind of a, uh, another subject but with all of the automation of information and and warfare going on you need some some humans in the loop there you know even in the, the automated loop um, 
the word has gotten out from people saying that that the uh, the people who are controlling the drones that that are are killing people that they are suffering from extreme stress. They're it's the equivalent of of combat stress. And then there were the the reporting of uh, all of the the frightening things that went on in the nuclear missile silos. People cheating on the tests. Uh, drug taking, you know, uh, those things aren't going to come to view unless there are human journalists who are, uh, who have the courage and, and the chops to go in and get those stories from people. I, I would add, I think, that the, uh, what, you, what you raised, the notion that uh, several billion now and more to come, people with uh, cameras uh, in their possession at all times that are connected to digital networks is a pretty profound change and uh, one of the roles of journalists is going to be to sort out uh, all of the information that comes in from the people who have those cameras but who who uh, would never in a million years consider themselves journalists but who are committing at some level acts of journalism and uh, there are uh, companies that have sprung up to help uh, analyze and uh, vet that material so that when people who are trained to sort this stuff out look at it, they can have some idea whether they're looking at something that's real or, or not. But when it gets all automated, that I think is going to increase the importance of people who can sort through the data and to help us put it into context. Well, and, and also I think we have many, many more eyes on the evidence. I think with the uh, with social media, you know, most recently there was the uh, dash cam footage from from Texas of, of the arrest that, that led to the, the death of, um, what was her name? Sandra, Sandra Lambert. Sandra um, uh, Lambert. Almost immediately, uh, so someone said, uh, you know, I'm a professional video editor, and it doesn't take a professional video editor to see that disappearing car there. This has been edited. Um, that was like, I don't know, within minutes, if not seconds, of that being mm -hmm. uh, made public. So many eyes on the, on the, on the media as, as more and more sources from dash cams and from... Uh, videos on on all of the, the closed circuit videos that that are are surveilling everywhere these days is that becomes part of if not part of the judicial process part of the the um, public knowledge uh, having many eyes on it uh, analyzing it you know just as way back when um, Dan rather lost his job because a lot of people mobilized over the story about um, George Bush and the National Guard and those were people were dedicated to doing their own research and and figured out that the font on the document you know came from something after the time it was I mean great detective work by by amateurs and you know that again way back in ancient history there was a US a legislator by the name of Trent Lott who lost his job because people dug up all of the racist comments that he had made and he thought had been buried. So I think, you know, we're seeing a role for the public. I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing that professional trained journalists are important, but also that citizen journalism isn't going to go away and it isn't confined to one area of the political spectrum. And frankly, I think having people with very different political views doing this kind of thing um, is one way to keep reporting and government and law enforcement more honest. I, I couldn't agree more and by the way there is a current war uh, situation where this is going on in a I think profoundly interesting way and that's Ukraine uh, where a uh, person in London who has uh, uses the uh, website, he calls it Bellingcat, B-E-L-L-I-N-G-C-A-T. Uh, 
he has been basically uh, deploying an army of citizen journalists and who are helping him analyze information uh, from Syria, from Ukraine, and elsewhere. And one of the most important things he's done is to look very closely at the evidence that is available for the uh, about the Malaysian Airlines plane that was shot down. Uh, in uh, I don't know, must must be a year ago by now, and. Uh, they've come up with a lot of very strong evidence that Russia was behind it. It's not conclusive, but it's uh, it, it looks it's convincing to me, uh, barring some other evidence that would come up. So this is a remarkable phenomenon, and this is very much how this is going to play out. Christy, what other questions do we have? Well, this one's interesting and, and something I've been thinking about a lot, and kind of a little contrary to what you guys were just talking about, in the idea that maybe people who are sharing information online, like in their social circles and stuff, maybe they don't actually care so much whether that information is accurate or not. Um, and a comment that this, this person, this participant said, which I thought was interesting, said maybe they seem to think of the fake news as a form of entertainment. So whether it's real or not, that's kind of beside the point, but isn't this exciting to sort of put out into the universe? Um, so kind of, I guess, two parts to the question. One, how do you feel about that? I think I already know the answer to that. But then two, um, what do you think we should do to counter that? You know, if you're seeing that in a friendly situation, and, and this person makes the point that, uh, tends, that that they tend to be that annoying person that's always correcting people and, and, and is kind of seen as sort of a buzzkill of this kind of thing. Uh, but do you think we should be doing more of that? I guess that's kind of the question. Two parts. Well, you know, um, it's not just entertainment. I think far more it's a kind of social currency. And, you know, that's always been true with young people. Um, having the first information about something in popular culture, that's kind of social currency. That's been true since before social media. Now that social media has ex it's accelerated the gossip cycle as well as the, the news cycle. And, you know, the the celebrity death uh, rumors and <coughs> other fake information that spreads very quickly via Twitter and and Facebook are, have become phenomena. I I do I do think that you lose a little bit of face when it when you report uh, to your followers that a celebrity has died and they really haven't died. But I think also it's kind of important to try to politely point out to people when they are uh, reproducing a, a Facebook meme or they're passing along a, a rumor on, on Twitter that, you know, this is a well-known uh, hoax or this has been debunked. You know, uh, Dan mentioned the crap detection resources at the, at, the, at the beginning of our conversation. And, of course, one of the oldest ones is Snopes. Dot com. Um, I'm sure many people, it used to be you would get this from your parents because your parents were a little less savvy, but you know, it, it comes from everywhere these days. You get these, these hoary old uh, uh, urban legends in the email, now on Facebook, that were debunked by many people years ago. And so, you know, so I think it's important to, to, to point out that they are not accurate, including, uh, and you might remember a little while ago there was a spate of people posting and reposting and sharing on, on Facebook this disclaimer that said, I, I hereby uh, declare that Facebook doesn't have the right to blah, 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 blah. And it, it was totally bogus. You, you know, you should read what you agreed to when you joined Facebook, that's what the, the legal status of your information is. Uh, making your own public declaration has no legal standing, but it spreads like, like wildfire. And I think that is, you know, people accuse me of being an optimist, and, and maybe, uh, maybe that's true in this case. And I, I think all you can do is try to establish a norm of at least politely pointing out that, that, that people are full of it. I mean, there are places, Reddit comes to mind, where people aren't so polite about it. And, you know, 
in the ancient days, um, there was something called Usenet. That was a world. It was kind of like the Reddit of of its day. And and college students got an account when they joined their 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 college. And the 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 old timers on Usenet were able to pass along the norms, among which was you know don't don't repeat uh, dis discounted information or or rumors. And they were not very polite about it. Um, and eventually, people learned the, the ropes. But uh, when AO and in every September, new students would get accounts, and there would be a, a rush full of people asking questions that were in the list of frequently asked questions, and typing in all caps, and typing in urban hoaxes, and and they were um, acculturated, maybe not very politely. But then AOL put three million people on the internet without any training at all and that became known as the September that that never ended and and I, I think that since then it's really become impossible for the people who have learned the ropes to teach it to all the new people who are coming online but I don't think that that means that we should give up I think that people who have gotten a clue ought to exercise uh, their knowledge uh, I happen to think politely works best, but that's my opinion. But you know, um, there are plenty of links, and that's that that list of of resources. Uh, Bitly slash crap detect, uh, one word um, that will enable you to send them a link that says, "Look, this is this source has definitively shown that this is a hoax." There's um, there are things that are more serious, like cancer quacks. Um, there's a a journalist uh, who happened to ha have had cancer at one point, who uh, Shani Jardin, who on Twitter, uh, whenever somebody raises points to one of these cancer quacks, um, really goes on a bit of a rampage about it, as as she should, because this is costing people's lives when you talk about that, and I and I think when you talk about Politics, it has to do with your liberty. And when you're talking about Googling your symptoms, it has to do with whether you're going to die or not. Um, some of this stuff is a little bit more important than did so-and-so a celebrity really die last night. Christy, you raised the word entertainment. Uh, in the question that some people are using, these, these sort of bogus things as entertainment, uh, and I... I don't object to that in one level. I think the uh, we all love the onion because the onion is uh, you know, deliberate, uh, visible, funny hoaxes. The thing about the onion is that they're really good at it. Uh, and a lot of the sites that try to uh, copy, imitate the onion are really bad at it. So stuff they do gets circulated uh, all too often because it wasn't it wasn't so expertly done as satire that anybody might know the difference. And uh, <clears throat> I think satire online is incredibly hard because it has to be uh, it has to be obviously satire or at a place where everyone knows it's satire, which is why the Onion I think is so successful and, and such a valuable place. Uh, but that to me is wonderful entertainment. I just worry about the uh, the things that are, uh, like Howard says, uh, that, that where there's real problems that can be caused by it. And Barrett Tundi Thurston, who is going to be visiting with us in the course, uh, and used to, he was the digital director at The Onion, uh, he has that great advice, which is before you Share something, you know. Click the link and check it out for yourself to make sure that it's true. And that's incredibly good advice. In fact, Howard, you're going to be talking about that kind of behavior in uh, your coming up uh, lecture in in a, in a couple of weeks. Is that right? Uh, tri triangulation, which is right. you know something I something I learned from real journalists. Uh, look for three sources before you pass along something. You know, the the case I talk about was I happened to be online when uh, the rumor that uh, 
Egypt had cut off the internet uh, in January 2011 during the, the uprising there. And that was the kind of thing that uh, Dan taught me this phrase, um, um, interesting if true. Um, and I, I didn't want to damage my reputation by retweeting that without checking it out. So I guess it depends. You know, maybe if you're um, a teenager and you've just gotten online, you don't really care that much about your reputation. That's another issue because uh, young people really need to be told that everything they put on the internet is going to be there forever, even if they remove it, and it's going to be searchable and, and, and linkable to their name. But I think uh, eventually most people realize that when they Google themselves, they're going to come across things that they don't want um, everybody believing about them, um, particularly if there are things that they said them, themselves, that reputation matters more than ever now. Um, so you ought to, you know, check a couple of sources. It's the ease with which you can get bogus information is matched by the ease with which you can check things out. It's just that uh, people kind of, the speed at which social media moves, people don't stop and think. And I think, you know, it's not rocket science. Stop and think. Google the name of the authority. Click on the link. I mean, how hard is that? Well, apparently quite hard for some people. Uh, I often liken it to, you know, an actual diet. People know they should eat better, but it's just so hard, and, you know, I don't really want to take the time. I feel like it's the same thing. I know I probably shouldn't share this, but it just feels so good right now to, to, to hit send or, you know, whatever it is without taking the time. But you're right that it's as easy to disprove something as it is to get the bad information in the first place. So that's an important message. And speaking of triangulation, someone asked, and specifically related to uh, evaluating the authenticity of pictures, particularly when you can't find any EXIF data in the pictures. Do you have any places or suggestions for that? Well, the, you know, the, the first thing to do is to, is to, to drop it onto Google image search. Um, quite often, you will find out exactly where that came from. Um, and, you know, if you're being... Um, recorded by somebody online and they send you pictures, uh, maybe you ought to put that, that picture on Google image search to see whether it's really the person you, you say it is. There, there's a whole television show about that uh, a while back and, and that's not going to uh, go away. Also in that list of, of craft detection resources I pointed to are some for determining the authenticity of photographs. There are algorithmic methods for looking to see whether um, the uh, the shadows in the back uh, background of photographs, for example, are are pointing in contradictory directions. Um, there are 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 ways that you can automatically detect whether something has been been altered. So there are tools for doing that. It's not impossible. And and just start with with dropping it on Google Image Search. And in case you didn't know that, if that image is located somewhere, um, Google will will look at it, recognize it, and and return you the list of links to to places that exist. Makes me wonder if people have already gamed that system to uh, fool you when you use <laughs> image search to check, uh, and it, the check apparently turns up proof of something that's deliberately false. I'm, I'm, I'm sure people have already played that game. Well, like I said, it's, a, it's, it's an increasingly sophisticated arms race, and I, I think we need to teach the things we're talking about in grade school. Um, I think by the time you get to high school, uh, you may already be well engaged in social media and uh, well, in, in grade school they are as well, but, you know, there's a, a fundamental issue here, which is you need to, to question the authority of the, the information, and that's called critical thinking. And um, many educators and parents don't want their children or their students questioning authority. So that's, uh, that's an, a societal issue that 
that people need to face. We may have to put up with our, our kids questioning our authority if we want them to be able to, to survive in, in, in the future. Christy, you've taught school before you came back to uh, the university to work on your PhD. Uh, can you talk about that and what your feeling was of how students were doing with critical thinking? Uh, sure. I think that the fact that they weren't doing that well is part of the reason why I am where I am now because I was so concerned by uh, sort of this uh, increasing need to just take what is given to them and go with it. It was such a strange thing. I was always taught to think for myself and I don't know that they were, they're getting the same message these days whether it's from their families or from the way school has changed or what. Um, and then you add to that this basically Pandora's box of information and it's like these two sides that don't reconcile each other and it's, it's crazy. So there's just a whole lot of, of of bad information being shared from young people, I think, and 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 just not really stopping to think what that what they see may not be real. I remember one time, one of my first years teaching, so this is more than ten years ago. A student came to class and said, "I just heard that Tupac is alive." <laughs> so I was like, "Well, of course you did. I'm sure lots of people have heard that." And so, in sort of in my case, I'm making a point. I took a CNN logo off the internet and typed up a headline that said, "Tupac is alive," and hung it on my classroom door and said, see, it's on CNN, so it must be true. Um, and I just, you know, that kind of really was like the first instance of, wow, there's just too much information and, and they don't know how to evaluate it. Um, and so I think, and it's not taught. It's not really taught in most cases as a, either as a, a its own meaning, media literacy, I mean, is not taught as either its own course or even injected into other courses. So I think there is a huge need for it. So, Howard, I promised you we wouldn't go much over uh, half an hour. Uh, I wanted to invite you to give us any uh, thoughts you have about where people can be pursuing this if they want to uh, dig a little bit deeper. And uh, you know, what what's you're, you continue your work in this area. Um, what can people who don't do this for a living do to continue thinking about these things for themselves? Well, uh, you know, I did, I did, did pitch that uh, that list of of uh, resources. Um, um, bit. ly slash craptytech one word, and that's um, open to anybody who wants to uh, suggest a resource or question a resource can make a comment on that page, and eventually. I or uh, Robin Good um, or you know one of the other editors um, will respond uh, to that. So that's a good source. Of course, um, Dan's books um, are uh, a good start, starting with We the Media and uh, the. I I notice uh, Net Smart on the on the shelf uh, behind <laughs> you, Dan. So I, I get into a bit of detail. Um, in that smart about some of the things that that you can do uh, to, to educate yourself or arm yourself with tools that are uh, available uh, online. Um, I guess also I'll just take the opportunity to uh, maybe foreshadow uh, the other other little mini lectures that that are coming up in the course. Shall I do that? Sure. Um, because. Uh, in, in that smart, I, I really thought for a while, what are the essential literacies or fluencies or set of skills that people need to know to, to personally thrive online, but also to, to improve the commons for everyone. And, um, and, crap and, and atten attention was the first one, because if, if you, you can't control your attention, it's very difficult to get to the others and that's a whole other topic and I think everybody knows that our, our screens are giving us an, an attention issue but after that immediately after that was crap detection which we've been talking about now and, and by the way of, of course I adopted that phrase from Ernest Hemingway who um, was quoted in the Atlantic uh, 
some years ago as saying that every good journalist should have a, a, a foolproof internal crap detector. And um, you know, when 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 I I, I call it uh, um, checking the credibility of online inf information, it doesn't get the attention that crap detection gets. Um, but also after that, I felt that the most important uh, literacy was that of participation. That a lot of people don't realize that the online world, that the web, is more than Facebook. Um, it existed long before Facebook became sort of the most popular way to socialize online. It, uh, the, the internet as we know it, the web as we know it, did not come about because some corporation or some government did it. It happened because millions of people participated. And I think if we want to see a future that is not controlled by big corporations or by governments or by special interests that enables um, your kids to create a new industry in their dormitory room, then we need people to learn how to participate. There are all kinds of ways to participate. Um, it's not just sharing stuff on, on Facebook. You know, there, there's Tumblr, there's WordPress, there's... Twitter, but you, you know what? You could also create your own website. That's one of the things I love about WordPress. If you are a, a college student or a um, an educator, you can go to reclaimhosting.com, and for $25 a year, you can claim a domain and install uh, apps like WordPress on your own server. Learn how to be a publisher and and not just a a, um, a contributor. And I, and and I think if we can keep alive a kind of green belt of people who are exploring new ways to to, to create online. You know, the web um, came along because some scientists thought it would be a, a important and useful idea for people to link their internet sites together and it transformed the internet. The um, search engine came along because some young people decided that they could they could suck the entire internet into a a server and and apply an algorithm to it. Who knows what we might have in the future if if enough people participate? Who knows what we might not have in the future if we don't work for Google or Yahoo or Disney or, or Apple in the future if, if if people leave it to the the companies that present us kind of packaged participation. Nothing wrong with it. I participate in in, in Tumblr and Facebook and and Twitter all the time. I also have my own websites as well. And then um, the finally, I, um, I talk about the I think all important literacies of collaboration that the online media uh, enable. We live in a world in which it's so easy to um, work collaboratively on a a document to have a conversation like this with people all over the world. Uh, pretty much for free on um, on on video. Uh, you know, we've got uh, what has been called social production that has given us the web and open source uh, software and Wikipedia. We've got collective intelligence. I'd say that those efforts uh, I mentioned before um, to discredit uh, Dan Rather and, and Trent Lott. Those were examples of collective intelligence. We've got virtual communities. If you've got a disease or you're a caregiver for a disease, you are a game player. You don't need me to tell you that you can connect with people that you didn't know before, uh, but you can establish very strong relationships with because you share a particular interest. I wrote about smart mobs in 2002, and of course we've seen everywhere from the the, the Arab Spring to um, U.S. elections that people with with telephones and internet accounts can can um, influence um, events. So many different ways to collaborate that that grant power to those who know how to use them. Um, again, I'm you know my theme is let's spread the word about this know-how and trust that people will use that that know-how in, in a positive way. If only the people with vested interests and, and power and a lot of money are the ones who know how this all works, believe me, they will protect their interests, they will protect their money, and, and not necessarily by giving you healthy information or true information. It's, it's really up to us. 
every single person who decides that they're going to check a link before passing it along is contributing to the the health of the, the future commons, the, the media that your children are going to be using. Howard, that uh, is such important stuff uh, about participation uh, in particular. It's something we're going to be talking about in uh, future weeks of our course, uh, including one uh, section that I'm that I put up about who controls uh, the media that we have today. And you mentioned uh, your book, and I wanted to just show it, uh, not cover your name, uh, NetSmart, which is, uh, I think, one of the most important books in this arena ever, and that uh, everyone should read, and uh, it, it's, it's absolutely brilliant, but then again, it's from Howard, so what do you expect? So... Uh, Howard, thank you again. Christy, thank you. Uh, were there was there any other uh, uh, quick question any that you had for Howard? I, well, I mean, there are a couple other user questions, but I there I think we covered most of it. So maybe we can do some. We can uh, write some responses to them later for running out of time. Howard, do you have time for one more question from our course? Sure. Okay. Um, okay, so really quick, let's see. Oh, here's a question. Have you ever found a case where Snopes or another myth-busting site that you, that you trust has been wrong about something? I have not, and that, that doesn't mean that, there, that such things don't exist. But it's held up pretty well for you. Yes. I, I, in this context, I, wanna, I, I think it's really important to point out that there, uh, and we'll talk a bit about this later on, there's this... Uh, huge number of fact-checking, uh, well, not huge, but there's a fact-checking industry uh, uh, that's come along adjacent to journalism or sometimes part of it, uh, which I find bizarre at one level since I thought we checked facts before we published it, but maybe that's the old days. Uh, but I, I, I do think that when a fact-checking uh, site that that's their thing. Uh, when they get it wrong, for me it feels like one strike and they're out. I, if, you, if I can't trust the fact checker to get it right, uh, why should I ever do that? And I, I don't know if this is too existential a question, but it's, it's, it worries me that uh, if we, we really have to be able to trust them uh, or, or that whole genre just makes no sense. So, Howard, uh, again, thank you so much. Christy, thank you. And uh, yeah. we're going to uh, we're going to go off the air. And uh, this will be archived uh, on my YouTube channel, where we're going to be posting the full length videos of our uh, uh, video interviews with uh, a variety of people and. Uh, so you'll be able to catch them there. Again, thank you both, and uh, see you again in person soon, I hope. Okay, okay take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.